Our next presentation um, is our keynote speaker, um, Tim Haig Sr. Uh, I'm excited to hear him talk, not only because he is our keynote address, but he is our first international speaker all the way from Winnipeg, Canada. So very excited to have him here. Um, Tim has an amazing story to share with you. Uh, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's as 46 and took part in a life-changing event that actually took place on TV. He's here to share his journey while illustrating that life can be lived to the fullest despite Parkinson's disease. If Before we get Tim to the stage, can, I can um, get your attention to the screens first. Thank you. Hello, Amazing Race Canada. My name is Tim Haig Jr. This is Tim Haig Sr. And we're coming at you from the winter metropolis of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. We're coming at you today to tell you exactly why we deserve to be on the Amazing Race. Listen, guys, if you live in this town, you got to be, number one, a little bit crazy, two, a whole lot of strong, because it is friggin' cold here most of the time. And we're here to tell you that we're you guys. We got this covered. We're coming yeah. at you. We are Woo! Here we are. Oh boy. Do you think that was too awkward? That was a little awkward. I felt awkward. I felt good, well, very awkward. Especially hopefully. when the neighbors came out. Yeah, that was... <laughs> I think it's better with clothes. <laughs> we'll keep it anyway. that way, I guess. Right. I don't know. Anyways, uh, folks, everyone has a story. And honestly, more than anything, we just want a chance to be able to tell ours. My dad, two years ago, three years ago, was given some news that most people it would have shaken them to the core. It would have probably rocked their world and they probably wouldn't have come out from it. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which for those of you who don't know, it's a degenerative disease that at one day, at one point, someday, he won't be able to control his body. We want to be able to tell the world that just because a diagnosis happens does not mean that your world ends or that you have to stop fighting. Yeah, like Tim says, a diagnosis does not have to be the end. For me, at 48 years old, I want to say to my wife, I want to say to my kids, I have four kids, I want to say to the Parkinson's community, that just because you've been given a diagnosis does not mean the end of your life, doesn't mean that you can't still compete, doesn't mean that you have to go quietly into the night and roll over with it. We want to, I want to stay strong for my kids and my family, I want to stay strong for my career, and continue doing what we do. Last year Tim ran his first half marathon, I've run a triathlon, one full marathon, multiple half marathons, and I plan on running another couple this next summer. Wow. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep doing. And we are convinced that this father-son team can be one of the best that you've ever had. Certainly the best you've ever had in Canada. We want to compete. We want to win. We, Dad, we expect to Dad, hear from you. You're, yeah. you're getting really serious on us. Well, I'm serious, folks. we got to go. <laughs> We're coming at you, folks. You want us. Here we go. Let's go. He's basically like Superman. A uh, close. <laughs> close. Yeah, yeah. That last little piece that you missed there, he said he's basically like Superman, and I said close. <laughs> well, it's nice to be back in the Midwest of the U.S. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, straight north. Get on I-29, go to Stafford, turn left. You'll hit my house. However, I grew up in Kansas City. <laughs> How do I end up in Canada? Good looking blonde. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she came down to school and the next thing you know, I was 24 years old moving to Canada. We were supposed to stay there for two or three years and we were gonna be near her folks for a while and come back. It's been 26 years. <laughs> I think it's time to come home. Nice to be in Des Moines. I've driven through once. First opportunity that I've had to be here. I see that you have never had two brown men, toques as we call them in Canada, scarves, boxer shorts, in the snow in church before. <laughs> if you ever, there's always a first. <laughs> if you ever wondered what it took to get on the amazing race, well, that's what worked for us. Uh, we were in season number one back in 2013 of the race in Canada, and uh, I like to say we got on the race because of my Parkinson's and we somehow survived it in spite of it. But that little video is what kicked us off in being able to get on the race in the first place. So I'm curious, just before we get started here too far, how many of you have watched The Amazing Race? Good, good, good. A lot of you have. 
How many of you have watched The Amazing Race Canada? Okay, she heard me speak somewhere before, so she knew. No, did you, you've watched it? Good show, good show. I rarely have that happen. In case you don't know, The Amazing Race, reality television show, the only one that tells you the truth. We don't rejig things. They, for good, bad, or indifference, they show you what we do. It's a reality television show. Think of it as a giant scavenger hunt. We typically race around the world looking for a variety of clues, attempting to perform a variety of tasks and not get sent home. In the American version, if you last to the end, you take home a prize package of a million bucks. Canadian version wasn't quite that much, but we don't pay taxes on ours, so <laughs> there you go. I'll leave out what we won to a little bit here for you. So if you haven't had the opportunity to see our version of the race, it's still on YouTube. You can get one of your grandkids to go find it for you. Look for it. <laughs> yes, we are a certain demographic, are we not? Uh, the Amazing Race Canada season number one. You can still find us, watch it. You will enjoy it. So we started off in downtown Toronto. I wake up one morning, I have the voices of my 15-year-old twins at the time ringing in my ears. They're saying to me, Dad, if you don't accomplish anything on this show, if you don't do anything else, if you don't do anything, Dad, please don't do this. Don't embarrass us. <laughs> we beat out 10,000 other teams to be one of nine teams to be on the inaugural season. And the first day, the first morning, I wake up with the voices of my twins in my head and their mental health well-being on my mind. I guess that tells you what a great father I truly am. <laughs> Nonetheless, we kick off in Toronto, make our way to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, we make our first of many mistakes looking for the butterflies. Managed to get through leg number one of the race without getting kicked off. We weren't the first team on the first season, the first leg of the Amazing Race Canada to go home, thus preserving the well-being of our, my twins for leg one. Make our way to Kelowna, BC. Get through Kelowna, make our way down to Vancouver, get lost in Chinatown looking for a lion dance costume. Make our way to the province of Alberta, coming back east get myself into a little line dance, my son gets us lost, and well, it's best that you just watch it. Here's Alberta. Maybe. Right here, Dad. Oh, Timothy! Roadblock. Who wants to get in line? Yeah, I'll take it. Do it. I'll take it. Okay, okay let's go. Yeah. Oh, my goodness gracious. Show them how the black man dances. I don't think I did Try it. Try it again. <laughs> oh, I, I stumbled a couple times, but it's getting there. It's close. We've been here close to three hours, man. Really? Shoot. All right, all right, you're freaking out. Just chill out. Just chill out. What can you say? It just isn't his thing. I should have done it. Oh, sorry, man. I may have to go home. I don't know. Hey, it sucks. Just keep it going, man. Okay. Don't give up on me, all right? Okay. I'm finally just frustrated. It's my ninth time. I just want to be done. Congratulations. We need a challenge that we can do. <laughs> we can do all <laughs> challenges, Dad. It's just how well. A challenge that we can do well. Let me restate it. Let's get it going. Wash those. Here we go. Tim Jr., Tim Sr. Let's lift it. Giant. Wait, one, two, yeah. three. Money. Well, Mr. Smarty Pants here comes up with a brilliant idea that we just pick the wheelbarrow up and dump it in. All right, my son. 
This is our car, sir. Congratulations, gentlemen. This car meets haulage. Yes. Thank you, sir. Drive yourself to Horse Thief Canyon Overlook to find John at the next pit stop. Oh, we passed it. Good. I know exactly where that is. You're going to be going left, and uh, it'll be on the right. As long as you're positive we're going in the right direction, then Oh, I'm yeah. Good. No, no, I'm positive I've seen it today. Okay. And this, uh, it, how, I don't, can this be right? I don't, I don't know. Should I pull the cops over and ask them? Oh, that's uh, by the museum. It's by the museum? in a circle for crying out loud. We're clearly going in the opposite direction. The deduction is we have to be last. That's why we've lost. Because of stupid crap like that. Tim and Tim? You were the last team to arrive. Yep, I figured as much. However, this is a non-elimination round. No. And you are very much still in this race. <laughs> Somebody up there likes us, man. We just keep on rolling. <laughs> that makes no sense. I don't feel like this is who we can be. When you don't feel like you're living up to your potential, then it's frustrating. We are here to win. And I appreciate that everybody else kind of thinks we're on the back burner, that they don't have to think about us. I just hope that they keep it there so that when we fly past them, they wonder what in the world happened. Amen to that. You ever have one of those days? Yeah? How many of you are with Parkinson's? How many of those days you had? Everything you touch turns to ash. Everything you grab is like trying to hold on to sand. We were absolutely frustrated that day in Alberta. We couldn't get anything right. Now, I'll have you know that 26 years ago when I moved to Canada, there's, in Winnipeg, there's a little place called The Forks. I got myself into a little line dance competition, took home CFL Blue Bomber tickets for being the most gregarious, I guess, at line dancing, doing a little thing called the Boot Scoot and Boogie. 26 years later, give that same black man Parkinson's and well, I'm dancing to a whole new tune now. I never did get that line dance. What you saw there was the most of that dance that I ever got right. Nine times later, everybody else was long gone. I was well over an hour behind the, the last team to leave. They finally said, please just get them out of here so we can stop dancing. They turned me loo loose and on we went. Tim Jr., when he came to that last task, he says, Dad, I saw it. We passed it this morning. I know exactly where we're going. We needed Horse Thief Overlook. He had seen Horseshoe Canyon. <laughs> Took us 10 minutes in the wrong direction. We come to the mat last. Typically, when you come to the mat last in the Amazing Race, you're kicked off. Except for in our race, there were two non-elimination legs. Non-elim means you get to stay in the race. We come to the, ra to the mat, John the host says, boys, you're the last team to arrive. However, however is officially my most favored word in the English language, ladies and gentlemen. However, this is a non-elimination leg and you boys are still in this race. My spirits went absolutely through the roof, yeah! We dodge the elimination bullet. We get to stay in the race. We're not going to embarrass my kids. We get to keep running this race. And in the very next second, my spirit went, no, because I realized we don't get to go home. <laughs> we have to keep doing this. And a matter of fact, tomorrow, they're not, not only do we have to do what everybody else does, but we're going to get an extra task to do which will all but guarantee us going home. We went back to our hotel room that evening, and if you've ever been to Drumheller, you will know that all things are dinosaur. Drumheller, Alberta, is where God sent all the dinosaurs to die. Therefore, everything is related to dinosaurs in somehow, some way. We went back to our dinosaur hotel. We got into a little conversation that went something like this. What the heck are we going to do? We are on the verge of being absolute fools on national television. How are we going to fix this? 
As we talked that evening, I don't recall how we came around to the conversation, but we came around to the conversation of my son's tattoos. Have to understand, I have four children. First two effectively came out of the womb. Maybe a dinosaur is being born now. We don't know. <laughs> we'll ignore that. My first two children effectively came out of the womb saying, Daddy, I want a tattoo. Daddy has always said, no, when you're 18, you go deface your body in whatever way you please. In Canada, that's the age of majority, or you become an adult. At 18, my first two children had their first tattoos. Can't complain too much about Tim Jr.'s tattoo. On this arm, he has a symbol of the Christian Trinity. On his back, he has a passage from the Christian scriptures, Psalms 4610. It's two words. It says, cease striving. As we began to look at that verse that evening, look at those two words, we realized that we couldn't remember what the word striving meant, so we went to Mr. Google. I know you would go to the Webster's Dictionary. We don't do that anymore. We go to Google. I'm going to get in trouble, aren't I? Went to Google. You Google the word striving, you'll find that it comes from the Old English for the words contend, to quarrel, to fight. It has attached to it bit of the old French for the word strife. It is a word that carries that burden of anxiety. It's that freaked out, stressed out way of thinking that says, by God, I am going to make this thing happen no matter what it takes. And we realize that that's how we had come into the race that we were going to win this race, that we were going to do this thing, that we were going to be the guys no matter what it took. And quite frankly, it wasn't working for us. <laughs> so we decided that we were going to stop. Not stop racing, but stop this way of thinking and start over. Now, we decided that we were going to do two things. One, we were going to start having fun because we knew that there were 9,991 other teams who would be more than happy to take our place in last place on the amazing race. How can we have had this much success? How could we have come this far in life and not be enjoying the ride that we have been given? How can we not at the very least stop and enjoy the blessing we've been granted. We decided to start having fun. And two, we decided to get up every day and simply do our best. We're gonna get up, have fun, and simply do our best. Now, I'm always worried when I give you this illustration because what I said, what I just said could be interpreted as this. The Tims made it onto national television, yay. They were really doing bad. As a matter of fact, they sucked. So, in their great wisdom, they decided to stop what they were doing, start having fun, and do their best. <laughs> it could sound a little trite. It could sound a little oversimplistic. A matter of fact, it could sound a little silly. But I want to remind you of an old proverb that you've all heard probably many times, and it goes like this. Everything that you've ever really needed to know you learned in kindergarten. My kindergarten teacher was Mrs. Popovich. Mrs. Popovich and I would start off pretty much every day of kindergarten the same way. I would walk into class, she would look at me, and she would say, Timmy, shut up. <laughs> I'm sure you're not Timmy. Okay, slight exaggeration, but Timmy has never had a problem talking, okay? More importantly, she would say to Timmy, Timmy, just do your best. Just do your best. And isn't Mrs. Popovich correct? In an age where we live being told day in and day out, you're not quite good enough. You're not quite pretty enough. You need another one of these. You need a little some more of that. You're not quite smart enough, good enough, fast enough, whatever enough show up to work and give us 110% today. Can any of you do 110% of anything? No. The best that we can ever give is our best. 
Now our best looks differently from one day to the next, and Parkinson's sure brings that home to reality, doesn't it? Some days my best is all the way over here and I look great. Some days my best is just here, just because it is. Some days I'm lazy and I'm over here when I know that I could be here. But the best that we can ever give on any given day is simply our best. We decided leg three in Alberta on the Amazing Race Canada to stop this crazy way of thinking, get up every morning and simply do our, ha start having fun and simply do our best. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to suggest to you that with our new found frame of mind, with our new focus, with our new zen-like calm that our race radically changed. However, it did not. We continued to suck. This is where the race taught us the meaning of the word perseverance. Great big long word, when we came across the word perseverance, we realized that Tim Jr. couldn't pronounce it and I didn't remember what it meant. Back to Mr. Google we go. Google the word perseverance and you'll get this definition. To carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. Once again, to carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. Google that word, you will find that definition, and alongside it, the faces of the Thames. <laughs> For never did we ever give you any indication that we would ever be successful on The Amazing Race. For the one person who watched it, she can testify to this fact. If you had watched it, you would have seen us lost all the time. In Kelowna, BC, we got lost. In Vancouver, we got lost looking for that lion dance. In Iqaluit, Nunavut, where it's really far north, we got lost looking for the territorial park. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing in Iqaluit. Do you think we could find that park? Quebec City, Quebec, I asked a mailman, a mailman, a mailman for directions. Who better to ask for the directions than a mailman? He sent us right when we should have gone left. We chased our tails around for an hour in Quebec City, came in last. In Cape Spear, Newfoundland, the most easterly point in North America, we were effectively in the semis. There were four teams less left. We were in third position. All we had to do was get to the mat and we would be racing for half a million dollars in cash and prizes and we got lost. The Toronto Zoo, last leg of the race, three teams left. We're finally in the lead. We get to the zoo before anyone else and the Thames managed to do it in an hour and a half. What the other two teams did in 15 minutes because we got over and over and over again, we struggled. Whether it was from my Parkinson's and its fatigue, the tremor, the anxiety, or just the simple fact that we couldn't read a map. <laughs> we struggled day in and day out. Yet we chose to persevere. We chose to get up every morning and enjoy this ride, do the best that we, that we can, and to persevere. People have asked me from time to time, where does that will to persevere come from? How do you do it? Well, for me, it started in August of 2010. August of 2010, it was a Saturday morning. I was sitting in my kitchen reading the Saturday morning newspaper, as I often do, and a brand new thought went through my head. That thought was, my left big toe is twitching. I'd been a nurse for 18 years at that point. Did what any good nurse would do. Put down his newspaper. After I did one of these. Yeah, my left big toe's twitching. Thought to myself, you don't just wake up twitchy for no good reason. Something's going on. Started with the psychological side of things. Thought, I'm not depressed, not anxious, job's okay, the 
kids are good. Wife is good. She's not mad at me today. There was no psychological reason for me to be twitching. So I thought, well, if it's not psychological, it must be physiological. If it's physiological, it's likely neurological. If it's neurological, it's probably MS or Parkinson's. My very next thought was, dear God, don't let it be MS. And ladies and gentlemen, that is literally my first five minutes on this journey with Parkinson's disease. My wife and I had just crossed our 25th wedding anniversary. Thus, I did what any good husband would do, which was, gentlemen, nothing. <laughs> Kept my mouth shut, what I did. Thought, I might be wrong. It might go away. We have a three-week holiday planned in October. We're going to Europe. Going to hang out in Europe for three weeks. We'll have a good time. We'll relax. It'll all settle in. If it doesn't go away, when we come back home, I'll tell her about it. We'll, we'll go see the dog. Well, what I didn't know at the time, which I have since learned, is that any kind of stress, good, bad, or indifferent, will make your Parkinson's symptoms worse. We decided to do in our 40s what you're supposed to do in your 20s, and that was backpack across Europe. We started in Madrid, booked our hotel there. Three weeks later, booked a hotel in Athens, Georgia. Athens, Georgia. <laughs> Athens, Greece. <laughs> Nothing in between. Now, I'm a little bit more of a five-star kind of experience than my wife is. This stressed me out a little bit, especially the evening that we showed up in Rome, a Saturday evening with no hotel book. Word to the wise, don't do this. I found myself sitting in a darkened train station talking to a guy who knows a guy who has a nice place to rent. Now, if this were your children and they got home alive, you would kill them. <laughs> because I find myself following this guy through the dark streets of Rome to go meet a guy who has a nice place to rent. Well, the short story is it turned out fabulous. It was a little boutique hotel. We spent an absolute fortune for it, but I didn't end up sleeping on the train sta station bench. What did happen was that a toe tremor turned into a foot tremor that turned into a leg tremor that sent me into a tremor telling my wife, there's something wrong with me. She looks kindly at me and says, honey, we've known that for some time now. <laughs> no, she did not. What she did say was that, look, you're a little twitchy. Something's up. We'll go see the doc. We'll check you out when we get home. Let's relax, have a good time, enjoy our, our holidays, and we'll carry on from there. And that's exactly what we did. We had an absolute great time, came home, and um, enjoyed ourselves immensely. I basically decided, well, from there I saw, when I got home, so, went and saw my GP, sat in his office for 20 minutes, had a discussion about the fact that I likely had young onset Parkinson's disease. But he said, hold on, we'll do our due diligence, we'll get you in to see a neurologist, we'll check it out, do a test and whatnot, and we'll see. Well, it was February of 2011, at the age of 46, I was officially diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease. To say that I was unimpressed would be the understatement of a lifetime. I was angry, but mostly scared. But you see, I, my father, my adopted father, died with Parkinson's. I had no illusions of what this diagnosis would mean for me. Having nursed many, many people over the course of 18 years of nursing, I had no illusions of what this would do to me. I unfortunately went on to do what many of us do when we get these kind of, this kind of bad news, which was to sit down on the couch, stop running, stop cycling, stop doing the things that I knew I needed to do to take care of myself, and did nothing. After about a year of that, I said, hey, this is not how you live. This is not how you respond to bad news. You need to get up off the couch and get going again. I did. Got back to running, cycling that next year, ran my first and probably only triathlon. I basically decided then and there, 
that there was one of three ways that I could respond to this disease. I could do the man thing, and I tried for a good while, what I call the man thing, which was to set it on a shelf, ignore it, pretend it doesn't matter, man up on it, and, and show it who's going to be boss. And as you well know, Parkinson's, she is a nasty mistress. She will call the shots. She will not be ignored, and every day you will, will deal with her. Decided, okay, if it's not benign, if I can't ignore you, it could be a curse. I could live under it. I could allow it to have my life, define who I am, take my relationships, take my work, take who I am. And at the end of that conversation, I just thought, that simply doesn't sound any fun. So if it's not benign, if it's not a curse, there was only one other thing that I could think that this could possibly be, and that's a blessing. There must be something in this thing that is both good for, for me and for others around me. Thus, I chose to walk forward with Parkinson's as a blessing rather than a curse and to not allow it to have my life. I chose to make it my new best friend, whom I hate. Can't get rid of it. I'd give it away if I could. You could have it. Can't get rid of it, so I might as well make it my good friend. I just don't have to like it. You've heard the old proverb that says, keep your friends close and your, en your enemies close and your friend... You know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to blame that on Parkinson's. Parkinson's get blamed for everything. I choose to keep it close. Thus, I walked into the Amazing Race Canada with the same attitude that I walked through life with, and that is simply this. Parkinson's could not have my life, and neither could it take the Amazing Race Canada from me. Thus, when I stood on a 12-inch wide plank, 100 feet in the air in Kelowna, I said, I will walk this plank, and I will not fall off. When I sat in front of 10 pieces of muktuk, whale blubber, I said, I will eat this, and I will not throw up. All the while having the voice of my mother ringing in my head, I hope you have one just like you. <laughs> You've got that same mother, do you? But the fact is, we know it's difficult. It's hard. It's hard to not let it get to you some days. And there are life there are some lessons that Parkinson's has taught me through the Amazing Race that I like to share with folks. I call them li living your best. There you go. How to live your best despite having this disease. Well, the first thing that I, well, the, the most recent word that I've come across that I've started talking about is contentment. Another great big long word, and I can't remember it all, so I have to go back to my lovely notes that says this. Contentment is an emotional state of satisfaction drawn from being at ease in one situation. An emotional state of satisfaction drawn from being at ease in one's situation. Now that's a heck of a word to put alongside Parkinson's. Because I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if I did, I doubt if there would be many hands that would go up that would say, are you at ease with your Parkinson's? Are you in an emotional state of satisfaction being at ease in your situation? It's a challenge. It's something I'm still learning. But I mean to learn this lesson. I have to be content with where I'm at. We recently had a giant elm tree cut down from our front yard. It, we have lived in this particular house for 11 years to date. That tree has stood in that front yard for decades. It, is an it was an absolutely beautiful tree, overhung most of our yard, our neighbor's yard, across our street. The entire neighborhood loved that tree. This spring, I had an arborist from the city of Winnipeg show up at our door and says, A, the tree's on city property. B, it's split. We're going to have to cut it down. And I looked at her and I'm like, what are you talking about? It's a beautiful tree. 
what's wrong with it? She walked me out, showed me, it split a ways down. I said, okay, but are you sure? Yep, we'll be back. And I thought, eh, it's the city of Winnipeg, I probably got five years. <laughs> Within six weeks, seven men showed up in our front yard. My wife and I were in the kitchen, heard a chainsaw go, walked around to the front living room for two hours, watched seven men do an incredible dance as they worked around one another to drop that magnificent tree. Huge limbs would come thudding to the ground. They had this little man machine that they would get on and had a giant claw on it, would pick up these huge stumps and throw them into a chipper and all but vaporize them. In under two, tr two hours, that tree was all but gone. At the end of it, my wife cried. When my daughters came home from school that afternoon, they cried. My neighbors were upset. They thought I had done it. People loved that tree. And I think that you would agree with me that it would be good and right to mourn the loss of that tree. It was a beautiful, beautiful elm. But at some point, the mourning has to stop. And if I were still mourning the loss of that tree months and months later, you would ask, why? What's wrong? But at some point, the mourning has to stop. And what do you do then? Well, what we're going to do is plant another tree. We're going to discover new growth, new beauty in place of what was. Will that new growth be what was? No. Will the new beauty be what could have been? No. But it will nonetheless be new growth and new beauty. Ladies and gentlemen, my old life has been felled by Parkinson's. I can't do a doggone thing about that. But I can replant. I can celebrate new growth. I can seek out new beauty and move forward. And for me, that is contentment. To celebrate the life that was, accept the reality that is, and know that I have a life still yet to live. Contentment. I have had to simplify my life. I don't run triathlons anymore. I don't run full marathons anymore. As a matter of fact, the other day I ran two miles straight. That's the most I've run in months. And I've learned to be content with that. To simplify my living and my thinking in light of my new reality and accept who I am today. To move out of my life the extraneous, the unnecessary, the things I can't do. The biggest thing of recent was in December, I retired from my nursing job. 21 years of nursing, all done. Easy? No. Necessary? Yes. Simplify my life so that I can carry on a life that is good and productive for my wife, my kids, my granddaughter, for me, and be able to give back to my world in a positive way instead of being absolutely riddled with anxiety and depression. Contentment, simplicity, community. Building a community around myself, whether it's my buddy who goes to the gym with me or my wife who is a phenomenal, I don't think of her as a caregiver, but she does a lot of that. She adds to and builds up my life, and together we walk through this thing called Parkinson's together in a partnership. Contentment, simplicity, community, and perseverance. Always perseverance. Never, ever giving up. No matter how difficult, no matter the lack of evidence of success, we carry on in our course of action, no matter what. We move forward. 
as the race played. Sometimes we feel that way. As the race played out on television, we would do what we call, we would hold what we called a viewing party week after week. We would get together with friends and family in a variety of different locations to watch the race together. We, uh, leg six, we were in Quebec City. We had gotten lost again. We were in the Boston Pizza there in Winnipeg. The lounge was full of friends and family. We had overflowed into the restaurant. Everybody's watching us come in last. We come to the mat, and we're getting the loser clap. You ever heard the loser clap? Yeah. That slow, rhythmic, way to go, boys. Good job, boys. You made it on national television, boys. You're from Winnipeg. We'll cheer for you. You suck. But hey, your team, you're the team, the town's team. We'll cheer for you. We're getting the loser clap, and it hurts. Except for one brief moment in time, four of us in that room, my wife, my daughter-in-law, my son, and myself, we stood there like gods because we knew the future. We knew that not only was this a non-elimination leg, we knew that we went on to win the whole thing. So as we come to the mat and John says to us, boys, you're the last team to arrive. I'm standing there with a little grin on my face. However, this is a non-elimination leg and you, your wives are going to have to live without you for just a little bit longer. The room absolutely exploded in applause. Everybody was cheering. Everybody was excited. They couldn't believe that somehow, against all the odds, against what anybody would have thought, the Thames somehow hit the second non a limb. They get to stay in the race. They get to keep working towards the prize. They couldn't believe it. I ran around the room high-fiving everybody like a madman. It was almost as much fun as winning the whole thing. Almost. If you don't hear anything else I say, hear this. At any point along the course of the race, had the Thames just simply taken a step back, just stopped, said, we can't do this. We're clearly not smart enough. We can't read a map to save our lives. We're constantly behind. We're never going to make up the difference. We're not pretty enough, we're not smart enough, we're not fast enough, we're not strong enough. If we had done that at any point, none of you would have blamed us. There's not a single soul in here that would have said, Tim, what happened? Where'd you go? You were so close. Guys, we were never so close. But the fact remains, the fact remains, there was a championship that had only one name on it. Just one. And whose name was that? The Thames. All we had to do was stay in the race and go get it. When that loser clap plays in your head, when Parkinson says to you, I can't, I don't want to, I won't, I want you to do this, one thing, stop and remember the Thames. That in spite of all the odds, in spite of everything that said there's not a chance that they're going to win this thing, we persevered. And in persevering, we did more than anyone would have ever imagined we could have. When we came into the Toronto Zoo, there were three giant maps of Canada set up for the last three teams. I walked in, looked at that map, and said, thank you, God. For you see, my wife had said to us before we ever left on the race, pay attention. You will need to know something. You will need to be able to do something. You will need to recall something. Pay attention. 
on the very first leg of the race, on the very first clue, at the top of the clue, I saw the rising sun of the BC flag. That evening, when I hit the mat, the greeter standing behind, beside the host, John, was wearing a little white flower on her lapel. I noted that flower. Later on, went and looked it up. It's the white dogwood flower of BC. Every night, I wrote down the flag and the flower of every province and territory that we, at that we attended. When we got to Toronto, there was only one old man with Parkinson's who knew every single flower and every single flag. Climbed up on a ladder, put all the flags in place, put all the flowers in place, wasn't sure about the Northwest Territory in BC. They're both multi-petaled white flowers. Climbed down the ladder, asked the judge, check it. She said, your map's not correct. Went back up, switched the Northwest Territories in BC, asked the judge to check it, done. Two tries, 10 minutes, because one old man chose to persevere. And ladies and gentlemen, that perseverance led to this. Yeah, somehow that never gets old. <laughs> Always fun to watch. But listen, I understand the hard reality of this disease called Parkinson's. Without a cure, it may one day win the war that I wage with it. However, today's battle is mine. As you go forward with this disease, don't ever forget the Tims. There is a win waiting for you. We all don't walk away with cars and trips and cash, but we have no idea where the next bit of research will take us, where the next symptom management will come from, where the cure will come from. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop. Even in the face of difficulty, continue on. Persevere. Even when there is little evidence of success, persevere. Because you can do more than you think you can. And there is a win waiting for you. And it may be just around the next corner. Don't ever, ever give up. Thank you so much for having me this evening. This morning. Thank you very much. I have the distinct privilege to talk to lots of groups like you. Um, thank you for that encouragement. If you'd like to keep up with what I do and where I'm at and the things that are going on, there's where I'm at. I'd love to see some of your pictures and stuff today. Hit me up on Instagram and Twitter or Facebook. Or if you don't do any of that, email me. Thank you.